Yes. Okay, very good. Okay. <clears throat> so where did we start and start in the last class? So adaptive uh, adaptive radiations. Uh, we started with Darwin. So finches. Darwin finches. Okay. I think we also did industrial melanization, didn't we? Yes. Okay. Yeah. We did industrial melanization as an example of natural selection, adaptive radiation in Darwin finches and in Australian marsupials, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Hanifa and Atif have, has, have joined. Good evening, Hanifa. Good evening, Atif. Good evening. Good evening. How are you all? How are you both doing? Fine, Atif. Fine, sir. Fine. Fine. Okay. Good that everyone can speak. Okay. Any doubts, Anifa, Atif? No, sir. Yes. All clear. Okay. So, Atif, would you like to give a summary today? I think we, we, we started with industrial melanization in the last class, and then we did adaptive radiation. And we finished with evolution <clears throat> being slow or fast in different organisms. Okay, am I clearly audible to all of you? Yes. Yes. Okay, very well. So, Atif, would you like to do the honors today? Yes, sir. Okay, very well. Um, Thank you. So Ciao. we learned about industrial mineralization, which was supporting evidence that uh, natural selection was happening. So mm -hmm. in England, before industrialization, it was observed that there were more uh, white wing moths than dark wing moths. But then mm -hmm. after industrialization, after industrialization <clears throat> the opposite was observed that there are more uh, dark wing moths. Yes, so opposite, this was was because... opposite was observed in the urban areas where industries were set up right yes yes and in fact the proof of the principle was that at the same time in the 1920s where when we saw the reversal of the proportion in urban areas in the rural areas where there is no industrialization these populations were still like what they were during the 1850s and 1860s correct so that this shows that only the change in the environment leads to selection naturally yes continue Atif. yes so, so this was because the predators will always uh, uh, due to the contrasting due to the contrasting backgrounds the predators will always spot moths and during the post industrialization the tree trunks were darkened so the dark wing moths had better camouflage while the white wing moths were more uh, easily predated yes right Correct. Yes. yes. Uh, then we learned about adaptive radiation. This is the process of evolution uh, in which different species in a given area uh, starting, uh, the, it starts from a common point and then radiates to other areas eventually. So, mm -hmm. a very good example of this is Darwin's finches. So, Darwin uh, observed a diversity of uh, black birds known as finches on Galapagos Islands, that all of them, many of them, uh, differ on the shape and size of their beak. Some of them are seed eaters, they had large beaks. Well, insectivores had uh, smaller beaks, and once that conceived nectar had very long and thin beaks. Uh, then the Darwin hypo hypothesized that all the varieties they evolved on the island itself from the original seed eating variety, and due to the shape of the beaks, they can consume uh, different foods. Yes. Then we learned about the adaptive radiation in Australian marsupials. So in, in Australian mainland, the number of marsupial mammals, mammals uh, they evolved from the ancestral population. And um, we also learned that when more than uh, one adaptive radiation happens in a given area, it leads to convergent evolution. Yes. And did you all understood how it leads to convergent evolution? So in this niche, 
all these three will show convergent evolution, right? Understand? These three organisms, these three pool group of organisms. So this was more than one adaptive radiation happening. Red is for one kind of animals, blue is for other kind of animals, green is for other kind of animals. But we, when they all end up in the same geographical location, but they are different organisms. So to survive in that or, uh, location, they have to uh, develop some common characteristics with their different structures. And when different anatomical structures fulfill the same function, what do we call it? Convergent evolution, right? Remember everyone? Everyone is clear how more than one adaptive radiation in the same geographical uh, region leads to convergent evolution. Is this clear to everyone? Zaid, Fatima, Anifa? Yes. Okay. Okay, continue, Atif. This, uh, then we learned about biological evolution in unicellular organisms. So unicellular <clears throat> organisms of life also evolved by natural selections due to differences in their metabolic capabilities. Um, then we learned that some organisms can uh, evolve faster than others. Uh, this is why. Why is this, that? This is possible due to the rate of the reproduction. Yes, this is like, possible uh, basically due to their uh, short lifespan and life cycle. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yes. Which you are right. Which actually impacts the rate of uh, reproduction because they reproduce reproduce faster yeah. and in a small period of time they can produce millions of progenies and thousands of generations yes right so this is where we end in the last class okay so aisha and rifat has also joined us good evening aisha and rifat how are you good evening sir <laughs> i'm doing good are you not well aisha yeah, actually, I have COVID. You have COVID or cold? No, it's COVID. Cold, okay. I heard COVID. Is it more or less the same? It's going to be the same thing over time. Okay, so let, let's, let's talk about some more concepts in today's class before we move forward. So having learned all of this about evolution, you now know how evolution started, how it is proposed to be started. And when the first cell already came to existence, natural selection from that point onwards started acting. And even in a microorganism, you know that natural selection plays a role because you know, even microorganisms can differ on the basis of their different metabolic capabilities, which can lead to their selection in nature or the non-selection of others, correct? We all, I also gave an example of the lac operon that works in, just one second. Okay, I also gave you the example of uh, metabolic processes like lac operon developing or evolving in bacteria. Now, <clears throat> and about the multicellular organisms, you very well know that you know, they respond to the environment and those who are both reproductively fit and also have uh, various characteristics that can help them to adapt and survive in the environment better, they get selected, right? So there are two things. First is um, that characters in biology, you have studied from genetics and also from reproduction chapter, how are characters transferred in, in organisms? generation after generation, right? If you talk about evolution of organisms, so there is this one term use, which is called branching descent. Okay. Now let's try to understand what is this. So this is the real essence of uh, the theory of Darwinian theory of evolution. So Darwin believed and he hypothesized, which we are proving now with evidence is that theory of evolution 
is governed by or based on two key concepts. One is natural selection, of course, about which we have studied above. And the second is branching descent. So nature selects the best, but when it comes to species, speciation, how new species are formed, then it's not a linear graph. Like they always tell that there was a unicellular organism, then a multicellular came, then came um, amphibian or reptile. Or, no, it's not like this, okay? It is a branching descent. Branching means there are branches. So there will be, let's say, <clears throat> you know, uh, the unicellular organism will be there. From this unicellular organism, there will be a multi-cellular one that will crop up, right? But some of them, and this will be eukaryote, right? Yes or no? Yes, sir. But some of them, still will stay unicellular correct yes sir. and what are they called prokaryotes prokaryotes are still there living with us and this just continues those which became multicellular there are all different kinds it's not like something evolved from the other okay so for example one group then is let's say uh, unis multicellular eukaryote, but uh, autotroph or uh, heterotroph. For example, if we if we talk about some will be fungi, right? You know, fungi evolved. On the other hand, there are plants and animals, right? So even in plants and animals, you know, there are plants and there are animals. Let's say. And even in plants, you will see there are flower producing plants called angiosperms, non flower producing plants called gymnosperms, bryophytes, pteridophytes, all these are there, right? In animals also, uh, so you must be knowing that which is the most primitive one? Fish, right? Isis. They have a two chambered heart. And it's not like from fish came the, so there's another branch that caused amphibians to come, okay? And when this got from amphibians evolved, on one side it was reptile and on the other side it was mammals. And reptiles that evolved into aves. You know what are aves? Not apes, aves. Birds. They are birds, yes. Dinosaurs were reptiles. You know, in many ways, chicken, a hen, is more closer to a dinosaur than it is to a human. Interesting, right? Because this is the point where they diverged. So this is bird. And in the mammals comes humans, right? But yes. in between is the reptiles and reptiles, dinosaurs were reptiles, right? Yes. So if you trace it back, birds will be more closer to dinosaurs than they are to humans because they share a common ancestry with dinosaurs. But to go back from where mammals came, it's different. Even in mammals, apes and all other mammals like there are primates and non-primates right even if i do it it's not a justification still so in mammals you know there are primates and there are non-primates correct so earlier there were there were non-primates sorry and then one branch became primates even in primates there were monkeys there were so they they are tailed and the other one i'm taking an example like apes they are not tailed and 
there were simultaneous evolution of humans homo right and i told you there are many there were many species of homo so you see that there is a common link here which means humans have not come from apes we still have apes we still have humans we still have monkeys all are present right it's also not going to be the fact that apes will become humans one day do you understand they can become they can evolve and become intelligent they can evolve and become uh, something but which they are not today but so will humans humans will also evolve over, over time they will not become humans okay they can become more and more intelligent and human like how many of you have seen this movie the, the rise of the planet of apes where the concept is that if you can unlock the cognitive capability the learning and the memory and the cognitive capability of apes they tend to behave like humans they tend to solve puzzle like humans you know even and it's still true you know that apes can learn how to use tools in the wild apes apart from humans apes and monkeys some species are some species actually use tools so monkeys eat this very uh, how they eat have you seen a monkey breaking something like a coconut you know i i recorded i just happened to record a very very interesting video so me and uh, my friend we went to zoo recently okay delhi zoo and we were just roaming around looking at animals and appreciating the the diversity and there there are monkeys the rhesus you know the rhesus macaques from where the rh factor has been discovered the rhesus monkeys they have a very short tail but they are the ones which normally you see in the name of monkeys in urban areas right in urban areas you will not find very long tailed monkeys commonly but instead you will find the rhesus monkeys in in india i am talking about so we were having these small uh, this lemon drink bottles the plastic bottles like nimboos you understand the small 200 ml and one of the rhesus monkeys just came and snatched it from my from my friends but the bottle was sealed okay now somehow because it might not be the first time that that monkey is snatching someone's bottle of a coke cola or or that uh, lemon drink so the monkey knew that this this bottle can actually be opened because this is how humans drink from it okay so i just happened to record it that 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 the monkey tried to open it through the through the teeth and successfully opened it and then was holding the bottle like humans and was drinking from it it's not like it would spill and then try to lick from the ground or something like that it was not spilling even a drop it knew that we can drink like this so it is a learned behavior of course right yes sir yeah so even apes apes can learn a lot of things even apes can learn sign languages or apes can learn uh, the process through which if you just make a puzzle for them and at the end of the puzzle they will they will get some food or a, or a, or a reward they will learn very quickly to solve the puzzle like humans human kids do but again in evolution it it works the chart looks more or less like this so what do you think do you think there is a linear relationship between different organisms here do you think there is a single line that from this came this and this came this and this came this no right there is not a linear line right what is it instead of what will you call it it is a branch right it has nodes and it is branching at every point you can see here is a branch here is a branch node here is a node right so this type of arrangement or is called branching descent so branching descent along with natural selection are the two key points right down branching descent and natural selection are the two key concepts are the two key concepts branching descent means ascent and descent ascent means going up descent means coming down 
so the whole evolutionary chart comes down you know from common ancestors to diverged multiple organisms so branching descent and natural selection is the key or are the key concepts of darwinian theory darwinian theory of evolution okay so is the darwinian theory of evolution which is the more which is the widely accepted and the most logical theory in the field of evolution with the most number of proofs do you understand this theory now everyone everything is clear till now yes all sorts of theory, theories and different proofs that we have studied everything is clear makes sense to you anyone wants to uh, discuss on anything or if you don't if you want more proofs for anything or you don't believe in anything that we have discussed in the class you are free to you know just discuss it or uh, raise objections against it because in scientific community criticism is the backbone it's very much it's not just allowed it is appreciated you don't have to just take anything uh, for the word of like as a word of uh, as a word of mouth because your teacher said that so you have to believe in that it's not like that so everyone agrees and 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 is convinced by all the proofs till now makes sense to you very well now so this was darwin's theory of evolution but darwin was not the first person who actually figured that there is evolution you know darwin was the first person to do a extensive observation because he got to travel around the world he reached the galapagos island and saw the finches he reached other parts of the europe as well before coming back uh, back to um, uk and he did a very extensive and elaborate observational work of the nature so he could appreciate a lot of things he could inherit a lot of things but you know before darwin there was one more person who was very famous in the field and his name was lamarck have you heard of lamarck anyone has heard of yes. lamarck and his theory is very widely and popular and was known as lamarckism the theory of lamarckism or lamarckist theory of evolution or lamarckist theory uh, view point of evolution so lamarckism basically in in one line if i tell you it's also commonly very famously known as doctrine of desire lamarck through his observations believed that more than the environment it's the it's the organism itself that decides in what direction to evolve you know how to change and what to become yes that uh, his theory is not accepted widely for biological evolution but let me tell you one thing that um, very interesting is like still at 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 a molecular level or at cellular level for many things which pass on from cell to cell people believe that the concept that not only uh, genetic traits are inherited and sometimes some 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 things that the cell ad, cell acquires during its life can also be passed on it is true it's debatable that how much of lamarckism is accepted and where it works but basically lamarck what he said overall in a broader perspective is not accepted because it lacks proof and it has been disproven by darwin's observation so lamarck believed write down the uh, the theory of lamarck says the theory of lamarck says hmm 
that the evolution of life forms. So the interesting thing is that even before Darwin, there was someone who believed that evolution is a true thing. Evolution has happened. Means organisms have changed over time. And he was, he was in fact also the first to, in fact, his theory was also not correct, but he actually disbelieved or tried to disprove the theory of special creation that everything is created as it is. Uh, like a divine cause and nothing will change till the end of the world. It was always same from the beginning and it will go towards the end. But he in fact said that no, their organisms are changing. But what he said that the theory of uh, 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 that the evolution of life forms evolution of life forms had occurred had occurred and driven and driven by use and disuse use and disuse of organs now it was it was very intuitive to think, think at, at the time because people were beginning to understand physiology and also evolution. So these were very new fields. The way we talk about evolution now because, see, let me tell you one thing. Uh, the amount of knowledge that a college student have about evolution, even Darwin did not have. It's not about the amount of knowledge that makes you a genius. You know, I have told it before as well. It's the, it's, it's the, it's the courage and the novelty and your thought process that makes you a genius or a scientist that you can start thinking about something in an in a innovative way. You define the problems. So one who finds answers is important, but more than that, the one who puts the question on the table is more important, right? Because if no one will rebel and start asking questions, there will not be follow-up scientists who will solve it, right? You, be, you agree with me? So to ask questions is the most important thing in science. It, it may happen it, that you may or may not be able to answer that question in your lifetime, but someone will. If that question is logical, fundamental, and um, you know an important one in science, then someone will at the end of the tunnel try to solve it. And we are exactly trying to do what uh, these scientists ask. So, and I've told you they were not scientists, they were philosophers or naturalists or people who observe uh, the world driven by passion. It was not their job or they were not head of the departments in XYZ university or PhD students. They were just driven by their passion to do science or to understand the cosmos around them. Okay. So he said, he used this word, use and disuse of organs. Now this was very intuitive to think at the time because it is true that when we use a certain organ more, it gets strengthened, yes or no? If you want to become a marathon runner, what will you do? Anifa. What will you do if you want to become a marathon runner? I will practice running every day. You will practice running what? Running fast? What yes. it takes to be a marathon runner? Is it the speed or is it the endurance? The stamina and the... Stamina and the endurance, right? Because marathon is not just a 100 meter that you shoot like a bullet and end it. In marathon, so the difference between a marathon runner and a sprinter is that one focuses on speed, exhaust the tank in 20 seconds, right? One, the other strategy is totally opposite. Use your tank to you know, sustain for the longest time and still maintain a uh, optimum speed. You don't have to, because if you are fast, for example, you know cheetah, right? Cheetah is the fastest animal. 
on on land yes or no are you there hanifa yes sir yeah but cheetah cannot keep running that fast for very long in fact uh, the way cheetahs hunt first they try to get as close to the prey as they can without letting the prey notice them because it it was very don't you think that if cheetah is the fastest every time a cheetah will set on for a hunt it will catch a prey right because it is the fastest no one can run faster than it so no one can also you know escape a cheetah so cheetah will catch every prey every time it will set out to hunt but that's not true in fact cheetahs only get successful you know one out of five times in their hunt on an approximate so around it's around 20% of their hunt gets successful you know why because they cannot maintain they cannot sustain that speed for very very long times a cheetah in one go if it starts running it exhausts very fast the tank goes out and if it does not stops after 10 to 15 seconds then you know uh, it might die because of issues and exhaustion because the body is heating very fast very very fast you are running the exhaust the atp is just burning in the body so to dodge cheetah you don't need speed you just need to stay there till 30 seconds alive so you must have seen on discoveries antelopes and these deers they cannot run faster than a cheetah but what they do instead how have they evolved to get uh, get through this predation what is their idea have you seen a cheetah or a tiger hunting a deer on discovery channel you don't watch these channels no no interest in wildlife Sorry. yes zed yes zed yeah they actually first uh, uh, look the prey uh, beside the grasses like uh, wherever they can hide and see the uh, prey uh -huh. like they hunt in case of lions it is like that but cheetah uh, cheetah first do the same thing and they run after the prey like if it is deer they run after the deer and for that long distances no but cheetah cannot run for long distance i'm not asking what cheetah does i'm asking what the prey does to to avoid they because run in circles yeah. they uh they run in circles uh... they don't run in circles they take sharp turns the moment they realize that now the cheetah is very close they will just take a sharp turn and that is what works against cheetah when you are running very fast when you are moving very fast you cannot take sharp turns remember yes. physics laws of physics your acceleration your momentum is so big that to just change direction you all have read about inertia of motion and inertia at rest right physics people yes science is all interconnected when you are running very very fast a moving object tends to be in motion and does not wants to change the direction very quickly it needs a lot of force to do that okay so deer run slower than cheetah that's why they can take very very sharp turns but cheetah just you know keeps going and then the when it realizes that the deer has Uh, taken a sharp turn it has to turn back again run and chase by that time the distance has increased so they just have to dodge the cheetah for first 15 20 seconds after that cheetah gets exhausted and it has to stop because the fuel is empty the tank has burned out and this is how deer survive do you understand yes yeah so what i meant to say is that multiple times in evolution you know it's actually coevolution two things are evolving together if one develops speed the other will either develop become faster than that but in this case they are limited by the muscles right the kind of body structure they both have they are limited by that and have you seen when cheetah runs have you seen a cheetah running in in any video or, or on a tv or in a documentary anyone has do you have you have you observed a peculiar thing about interesting thing about cheetah's run yes ed 
what have you observed so they first jump and uh, i am not able to like explain it uh, but is one single sentence their head is stable go to youtube right type that the front view of a cheetah running you will see the whole body is just moving in a slow motion if you see the video in a slow motion it will make more sense to you but the head does not moves from it position more okay it stays static this is how a cheetah runs the head is focused and static the rest of the body is moving yeah so that's where the speed the the explosive speed comes from because it maintains because if it is all moving and jiggling then it's difficult to run very fast okay and when you are running very fast your blood is heating very fast and you would not like that heated blood to run in your arteries and veins for very long you need to cool down otherwise you know uh, you can get hemorrhage or your 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 heart can just get an attack or explode it needs to cool down heartbeat beyond you when you run your heartbeat also you know fastens so it is always co evolution one thing evolves speed the other evolves agility because when you have lot of speed you are not very fragile agile and flexible but if you have flexibility you can dodge speed and vice versa okay but lamarck said that if you use and disuse an organ you can actually evolve and it was an in interesting thing to think at that time because we all know if i have to make my muscles stronger and bulkier and bigger what i have to do just like being a marathon runner uh so the we started with fatima say uh, sorry uh, we started with the uh, um hanifa saying that a marathon runner will start running longer distances so today you run 2 km next day you aim for 2.2 then 2.4 3 4 and that's on you keep increasing your endurance over time so but after, if you keep doing this for 6 months or 1 year you actually become a marathon runner right so if you use or disuse your organs for example if you go and join a gym you do a, get into a diet and a gymming regime you can actually make your body bulk up right you can get all the muscles bulked up you can actually make a big bulkier body so your body has changed now you are stronger right if, if you want to become a weight weight lifter you can do that if you want to become a swimmer you can do that so this observation led lamarck think that if humans can do that you know for example other organisms are also doing it for example the long neck of the giraffe so he gave this example that giraffes have long neck because they in the wake of reaching at the top most leaves which are very very nutritious and uh, you know the best of the leaves present at the top they started stretching their heads just like you start you know lifting weights to to bulk your biceps and make your arms stronger they started stretching it it's also a belief you know not just a belief but it also works you must have seen or heard that if you um hang during your early years as a teenager or as a young person you can shoot up your height yes so it is both controlled by genetics plus external factors many exercises helps you improve your height have you heard this or not so it's it's majorly controlled by genetics but people do that yes or no just like making your body stronger through gymming or exercise or playing so giraffes also started stretching their necks and as a result generation after generation they did that and their necks actually grew longer in length but one thing that lamarck forgot to address was these are these are acquired behavior uh, acquired traits right if i start doing if i if i start doing exercise and gymming and if i make a bulkier body can i pass it on to the next generation is it possible no no right because i have acquired it it's not a genetic trait darwin on the other hand said that you know it's natural selection and it's in the genes it's in the genetics like organisms have characteristics the best suited characteristics help them survive better in the environment and uh, then mendel came and said that they were factors and those factors were later on figured out to be genes and then alleles were discovered which are the two types of gene and this is how science progressed 
But at that point of time, when Lamarck thought that use and disuse of organs can lead to evolution, it was, um, you know, discussed and many people supported this also. So write down, Lamarck gave the examples of giraffe. Lamarck gave the example of giraffe. <clears throat> who attempted to forage who attempted who attempted to forage or eat leaves leaves from taller trees taller trees had to had to stretch their necks had to stretch their necks and adapt and adapt to a longer neck adapt to a longer neck now he proposed that they passed on they passed on this acquired character Am I audible, everyone? Yes. Sorry, I, I got a power cut and lost the network. Okay. Um, one of you must be host. Anyone who's host? Let me see who's host. Okay. Yes, can you see the screen that I'm sharing, everyone? Yes, sir. Yeah, sorry for, sorry for the inconvenience. Okay, so I was saying that then he proposed that they passed on this acquired character. Passed on this acquired character of elongated necks. next to two upcoming generations or to succeeding generations a 
Okay. So this part, you know, this theory is not or is disproven now. And one thing that disproves is a very, very simple experiment. <clears throat> so if acquired characters could have been passed on, then one thing that I said that, you know, kids of bodybuilders would have been bodybuilders already by birth. They would have got stronger muscles and they, without joining a gym, they would have grown up into, you know, into bodybuilders. Yes or no? But that does not happen all the time. Correct? Also, the experiments have been done in mouse. For example, if use of an organ can enhance it, disuse or removing. So if I cut the tail of two rats, male and a female, and then breed them together. Will the progenies be tailless? Yes, sir. No, the progenies will still have tail. Why? Can anyone tell me why? Sorry, sir, I heard it. I said that if the progenies will have tail. The progenies will have tail, right? You understand, Atif? Yes, sir. You're not audible clearly. Are you speaking something? Sir, can you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you. You again mute. I was saying that. Yeah, tell me. You're still mute, Atif, if you're speaking. I, I can't hear you. Yes, sir, no, it's fine. Is what were you saying? Okay, now it's fine. Uh, I'll set up the mic. Okay, so what were you saying about the tailless progenies? Will the progenies be tailless? No, sir, they will have tail. They will have tail. Why? Because, because tails are a result of the genetics. You need to have the gene that, you know, the gene or the genes that led to the development of a tail in our organism, right? So even if you cut the tails of mouse, now we know this reason, okay? Because we know about genetics and everything, it's been figured out. But now we know that if you cut the tails of two rats and you let them reproduce, the progenies will still, because their gametes are still having those genes, right? Unless and until you do something to the gametes, gene editing in the gametes, you cannot um, make just by acquiring. So it is an acquired trait, right? That they have left, they have been made tailless. So for, it does not matter. You can just keep doing this. For thousands of generations, you can, if you keep cutting the tails of the parents and still make them reproduce, even after a thousand generations, mice will still have progenies that are, that are having tails. So it's cl clear that acquired characters cannot be passed on to the next generation. Okay? Right? And about every other organism, we are still evolving. Every organism is, a, is in a continuous process of evolution because evolution is a process. It's, 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 not, um, it's not the result. Um, sorry. Um, it's not a final result. No species have reached their final uh, like evolution form. Like humans are not, you cannot say that we are not evolving any further because we are evolved. We are still evolving. We, there are changes that, are, that we are incorporating in our genome, subtle, subtle changes, which over time, like after 10,000, 20,000, or let's say 50,000 years in future, humans will be very different from what they are today. Okay. Okay, cool. So um, now let's talk about some mutations. So is the Lamarckism theory clear to you? And why it got uh, refused? Is that also clear to you? Everyone? Yes, sir. Very well. Now coming to some mechanisms, basically how it... Mechanisms of evolution. So in short, there are two things that make organisms 
evolve and you know uh, you know about both first is mutations right how will an organism evolve when it will have changes right it will be different from other populations yes or no evolution is all about accumulating changes over time and then becoming different to be able to adapt to a new environment yes or no so one thing that cause it or that drives it mechanistically is evolution uh, is mutations now mutations as i have already told you they are sudden right on they are sudden random and inheritable changes sudden random directionless and inheritable okay so they are sudden random directionless and inheritable changes in dna gene okay correct this can make organisms different and one more thing about mutations how it is and what is the other thing that drives evolution they're called darwinian variations or in other words we call it natural selection that happens through both mutation and other thing is have you uh, in in chapter 3 human reproduction okay am i still audible people somehow i'm not the host now yes sir you are audible okay i okay can you see the screen again yes yes yeah so the other thing is darwinian variations okay which happen over time now they are uh, directional but let's uh, but talking about mutations first you have to remember this one scientist whose name is hugo de vries i'm sure you remember where have you heard this name before remember mendel's work yes sir there were three independent scientists who rediscovered mendel's work and raised them to the status of laws yes yes sir do you remember one name there you studying this hugo de vries yes so basically hugo de vries um bring uh, propose this idea of mutations that he said so he worked on the model system that is work that he worked on was a plant system called uh, um evening primrose evening primrose he worked on this system and he proposed that due to mutations there can be large changes suddenly happening in a in an organism which can make it more adapt and better in its environment now mutations most of the times are i have told you they are harmful only always right because mutations are random it is it is just happening anywhere it's like you uh, remember i gave you this analogy that imagine an organism as a painting a completed beautiful painting everything is an, a, a, at its right place so you have you have made a scenery you have made clouds mountains sun the birds and trees everything at the right place if you are making a scenery you will not make trees in the sky right you will make it somewhere where it makes sense yes or no i'm not talking yes, about sir. some abstract art but let's say we are drawing a scenery so in a scenery every and trees will not be you know silver they will be green because there are no silver colored or golden colored trees around us so everything will make sense because right colors and at right places you will draw certain things so makes sense right it's a painting it's an organism is also like that it's surviving 
so it has everything working in in a right manner in evolution now mutation you can think of like this you closed your eyes you are blindfolded you take any random paint brush dip it in any random color you don't know what color what paint brush where you're dipping and then you make a stroke anywhere randomly on that painting so 98 out of 100 times you will end up you know destroying the painting right yes or no yes sir why because you just made a random change in a already well defined well made painting okay but it can also happen that you happen to take a brush of the right size you happen to dip it in a blue color the right color and you happen to put a stroke just in the area where you draw the sky and the way you put that stroke it's just looking like a perfect cloud or it's just getting it's not making uh you have not destroyed the painting it's not it's just adding to the painting it can also happen yes or no but the chances are very less the probability is very very low yes or no people do you understand what i'm talking about no and you can say no you do not understand do you understand atif zaid hiba fatima yes sir yes sir yeah so that's that's how mutations work so they are directionless so they can happen anywhere if they happen in some very very important gene where it changes the gene even a bit for example sickle cell anemia it's a disease what happens in sickle cell anemia you have already studied fatima what happens in a sickle cell anemia remember are you there fatima okay no one wants to talk okay so in a sickle cell anemia there is a single point mutation that happens at one particular locus in the hemoglobin gene which causes the the shape of the whole rbc to get altered and become sickle shaped right so that's a disorder just by one single base getting mutated so it can also be deleterious sometimes it can add on as a capability you know it got the mutation happened in some gene which started giving an um, bacteria an antibiotic resistance so now the bacteria can survive even in the presence of antibiotics something like that can happen right so he said that if evolution works for the benefit works for the good the positive manner it can bring very large changes in very small time and that concept is known as saltation saltation can happen through mutations so right down saltations are single step large variation through mutation okay whereas right down the darwinian variations second thing is darwinian variations which is not happening through mutations okay it's happening in a long term by selection pressures in the nature sexual reproduction etc so darwinian variation right down it is gradual it is not sudden it is gradual it is directed okay it's gradual directed and non random do you understand the difference between the two everyone yes very well now 
so whether it is mutation or recombination through sexual reproduction leading to darwinian variation still organisms are changing through both ways and evolution is happening now let me come back to some mendelian genetics you remember studying mendel everyone sorry remember studying mendel so now i am going to talk about this one principle which i will start talking by starting with alleles hardy weinberg principle now this is something you have to pay a little attention to it's easy to understand once you understand this it's very very simple now hard before coming to hardy weinberg principle um let me discuss this one thing with you which is called the gene pool the total gene pool for any population any any species any population it is basically constant and what do i mean by this by this i mean that have it has it has it ever happened to you that you happen to find someone who is a look like of another person but they are not related at all even their ancestors or their generations are not related to each other you you meet someone and you're like oh you look like one of my friends who used to live here happened with you ever yes yes, sir. yes it's a very common thing right and also you must have seen there are many look likes of movie stars or celebrities you know so many features of theirs matches with the celebrity and there'll be many features that don't match and the whole trick is to hide the features that don't match most of the time if you see the nose and the face cut is matching so they will keep the same beard that the celebrity keeps and they will wear a glass so that their eyes are not visible they will keep the same hairstyle and they will look like that celebrity yes or no yes sometimes even the eyes match so my question to you is the that that person who you whom you met and the other person the celebrity or your friend like whom it resembles if they are not connected or they are not related anywhere they are very distant from each other their families are distant how did they ended up having the same features because everything comes from parents and to the parents from their grandparents and then from their parents and from their parents but they had different parents different grandparents different great grandparents one lives in india the other lives in america the ancestors never visited each other then how did they have the same features or similar features any idea no idea because yes anyone is answering that z uh, say no idea okay no idea so you unmuted yourself to say no idea that's also that's also fine okay yeah but um yeah so i was saying that the gene there is a gene pool like for every character there there is not infinite um alleles do you agree and if there are finite alleles there has to be finite results of their interactions you understand yes so the for example let's take talk about the eye color and the shape of the eyebrows and the ear shape and whether ear is lobed or not even if there are hundreds of different variations but still it is fixed no it is it is it is constant right it's not like the gene pool is infinite and you will never meet someone having the same feature ever again in families it's more common that we see that the gene pool is limited but even overall as a population humans have finite features that is what makes them look like each other and look like human do you understand yes yeah yes very good so the hardy weinberg principle actually states right down this principle says
this principle says that the allele frequencies that the allele frequencies in a given population in a given population are stable are stable and is constant and is constant from generation to generation constant from generation to generation in other words you can also say that the gene pool the gene pool by gene pool i mean total genes and their alleles their alleles in a population so the gene pool remains a constant make sense everyone yes now this is known as hardy winburg principles actually defines the per concept of genetic equilibrium you have studied this term before in science if not in biology then in chemistry chemical equilibrium what do you mean by equilibrium so state of rest equilibrium is not state of rest actually uh, for chemical uh, chemicals can never stay at stay at rest they are always constantly colliding with each other elements and there is the breaking and the making of bond happening but what do we mean by equilibrium so equilibrium is not happens. no it's not that a state that nothing it's a, if you under, understand equilibrium as that that's a myth there can never be a state in universe where nothing is happening do you do you think being being science students that there can be a state where nothing is happening there can never be a state where nothing is happening right to stop the move motion of molecules you have to achieve absolute zero the temperature where there is not a speck of heat energy or any kind of energy present in the system everything just freezes and you cannot reach absolute zero ever even the super condensed super cool liquids are not able to touch absolute zero right minus 273 what yes hiba is giving an answer and a beautiful one a state of balance it comes from equi equal so equilibrium is if you are making 100 bonds in a system and breaking 100 at the same time th those similar the same bonds then the net result is zero right it's in a state of balance so let's say there are two things one is increasing something and the other is decreasing something but they are both doing it the same so it the the system will fluctuate but overall it will be in balance you understand yes yes or no very good heba so genetic equilibrium also says that the frequencies now it will of course the allele frequencies will change or the allele um um in any given population there will be different kind of alleles at different time points in a population but it will eventually in a broader perspective balance it will stay constant right now this hardy winburg principle that, that talks about genetic equilibrium let's see how it uh, how it it also says write down mathematically what it means that the sum total sum total of all allelic frequencies is if there is nothing happening then the sum total would have been zero you understand atif 
it's but it's not zero it is one so the sum total of all allelic frequencies is one just like now how do we understand this mathematically let's let's do this so um, give me any example of a gene which has two alleles mostly we have two alleles now we will we'll, for the sake of simplicity we'll we'll work with two allelic system so let's say capital t and small t right it's a heterozygous condition but still give rise to tall plant if there is no incomplete dominance yes if the law of dominance is followed this will give rise to a tall plant agree everyone yes yes okay now let's say what are the other possibilities so here let's say i say that p defines the frequency of this allele capital t right on p is defining p is defining the frequency of allele of one allele which is capital t and then q is defining the allele frequency of small t in this system okay now there are three possibilities one is that an organism can be capital t capital t right so what is the frequency here of this allelic free uh, what is the frequency of both the alleles being capital t and capital t if it is p for one for both being it it will be p square right agree yes and for small t small t q square and for capital t and small t now this is the tricky one tell me p plus q which means pq no sir p plus q pq be multiple you cannot plus it right these are two different alleles you cannot plus two different alleles frequency of one allele cannot be added to the frequency of other allele right it can only be multiplied that's the point that's why the p p square came otherwise it would be 2p no why didn't you say 2p here if we are adding then this is p plus p 2p this is q plus q 2p so is it 2pq 2pq 2 into why, pq why 2 into pq because it's written in the book yes yes so that's how you should not think why do you think there's a 2 here so it's pq understandable p into q because the the frequency of one allele is only p because in this case it is p square p into p here it's only q because here it's q into q so here it will be p into q pq but why is this 2 here correct the correct frequency is 2 pq but why 2 anyone can think if you can think this you understood evolution and biology biology is not away from mathematics and physics you have to understand this it's 2 pq because this is just a representation that we make it can be capital t small t capital t coming from mother and small t coming from father it can also be small t and capital t small t coming from mother and capital t coming from father you understand but in both the cases we always write the dominant one first so for the sake of biology we represent both of them as hetero like it's the same condition so functionally it's the same condition right whether mother gives small t or father gives small t does not matter because whatever is the dominant will be expressed but mathematically when we talk about its its availability in terms of frequency in a population these two are different possibilities yes or no do you understand this everyone yes 
Yes, sir. So that's why this two is here. Now, the Hardy Winwork principle says that the sum total of all allelic frequencies, which means P square plus two PQ plus Q square is equal to one. This is what the formula is. Understood, everyone? So we can write this P plus Q the whole square, right? Exactly. Now in mathematics, you, have, you know that this part actually resembles a square plus 2ab plus b square. You have studied something like this in mathematics, right? Yes, sir. And this is written, this is expression for a plus b ka whole square, right? Yes or no? It resembles this. P is a, p is a here, q is b, q is b here, right? Yes, sir. So basically there are two alleles, P and Q. So it is P and Q, the alleles P and Q ka whole square. P plus Q whole square is equal to one, right? Agree everyone? Now, where yes, to sir. use this? Now, let me say, that sorry. Uh -huh. So we'll do some questions, but later on. Okay, before that, let me also tell you. So you understood where does this formula came from? So the Hardy Winberg genetic equilibrium to maintain genetic equilibrium from this thing. Frequency of these two alleles are this and this heterozygous allele this. Yes or no? Say this. Yes. Okay. Now there are five factors that can affect Hardy Winberg principle. And this is a question which comes in exam. So write down the question. What are the factors? What are the factors? that can affect hardy Winberg equilibrium. So when we say that the gene pool is constant and um, the sum total of all allelic frequencies will be one, we assume certain things. In mathematics, you must have, how many of you like mathematics or used to like mathematics till class 10th? I think it's mandatory till class 10th. Anyone who, who has taken biology with, with mathematics? Zed. Okay, Atif, okay, Atif has. Zed, you have also taken biology with mathematics? Okay, those who have not taken, don't worry. I also didn't have biology with mathematics, but I think, the amount of mathematics you need to good, do good biology, you can learn it at any given point of time. And we all know that in mathematics, we always say that let's assume X is equal to something, right? To solve certain equations. Yes, yes or no, Atif? Because if you'll not assume some constant thing, then it becomes very, very difficult to reach the solution. So here also to assume that the gene pool is constant, we assume that certain things are not doing, like they are, they are also constant, okay? Now these factors, when they come into play, they can actually disrupt the Hardy-Winberg equilibrium and can cause a shift in that equilibrium. And then the re result, um, the equilibrium will be deviated from its thing. Now the first factor that can affect Hardy-Winberg equilibrium is a genetic flow or gene migration. It's also known as gene flow or gene migration. Now, there's a difference, slight difference between the two terms, but they are used mostly in the same connotation. 
Now by gene migration, I mean that, um, let's say there was a population of green beetles. So each dot that you see on the board here is a, it's a green beetle population, okay? Can you see this green population? And let's say at one different location, there is a red beetle population. Can you see this red population? Yes. Now, if some of these beetles, like majority, many of these beetles just migrate from this population to this population, over time, the population will look something like this, right? There will be green beetles among red beetles, yes or no? Yes. And their genes also have migrated. Like this happens when organisms change their habitats and migrate to different places due to you know shortage of habitat or humans actually invading their territories and then they have to set up themselves somewhere else where they have to mix with other kind of populations where with whom they can mate and cause so this can cause uh, migration of genes or gene flow okay now now gene flow the word gene flow um, is used for a bigger change if it is just a migration happening once a major migration that's called gene migration if a gene migration is happening multiple times, that's called gene flow because a bulk is now flowing. You understand? Is it clear, everyone? So basically, they are same concept, but gene gene flow is when gene migration happens multiple times between the between the two uh, populations. Is it clear? So write down when a section of population when a section of population migrates from one place to another place and another population. When a section of a population migrates from one place to another place and another population, It's known as gene migration. It's known as gene migration. As a result, as a result, new genes and alleles are added. As a result, new genes and alleles are added to the new population, are added to the new population and are lost from the older population and are lost from the older population. Okay, is it clear? Yes. And the last point is, if gene migration happens multiple times, if gene migration happens multiple times, then it is called a gene flow. It's a bulk flow. Okay. Clear? Okay, so I think we don't have time left now. Okay, so let, let's stop here at this first point. We'll cover the other four factors uh, in, the, in the next class. Okay, everyone? And then I'll go to dis discussing with you a, after understanding the evolution, we'll come to a broader picture where we, where we will discuss evolution of plants and animals in some little detail. I think after that, 
the last part of this chapter is evolution of man that will take some time because there are many things that i have to teach you which are more correct uh, than ncrt teaches it so but ultimately you have to remember what is the recent advanced knowledge that we have but you also have to understand what you have to pick if it comes in the entrance because entrance follows ncrt okay but ncrt is a little outdated in terms of knowledge so i'll also tell you what's the recent thing the, the theory the science of evolution believes in okay so in the next class we'll do the rest okay so i'll see you in the next class everyone take care and please keep revising and bring your doubts whatever your doubts are with evolution don't believe every anything that either me or the book says